pleasure to have Nama uh, Gava Satoroski. I am gonna yeah. picture her name, sorry. Uh, yeah, you did it right. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I got that partially right. And Nama is a faculty in the Technion Institute in Israel. Uh, and she studies microbiology and immunology, really combines the system biology approach that we're really fascinated about. And her research has really eliminated a lot of insights on interactions between the microbes and the host immune systems. She has started her group in the last few years and has really won so many awards in her training <laughs> early faculty career. I'm just gonna name a few. I, I guess all these awards are from really famous people, UNESCO, L'Oreal Award, mm. the Human Frontiers mm. Fellowship, the Ambo Fellowship, the John F. Kennedy Prize, the Tava Prize, the Barn Host Prize. Thank and you. She, she received her training uh, uh, with undergrads in Tel Aviv, double majoring in chemistry and biology with Summa Cum Laude, and her master's and PhD are also from the Weizmann Institute studying actually system biology and protein dynamics, dynamics in cancer, which is related to our work. And her postdoc was in Harvard Medical School studying gut microbiome host interaction with uh, Professor Casper. So I think today we have a great pleasure to listen from Nama for her studies on the modular treasures um, of the gut microbiome. I think it really affects a lot of disease we are really interested in and we're excited to learn from her. Lama, I'd like to take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting. Really, I appreciate it. And it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. And it's uh, fun that with Zoom, we can do it like in uh, minutes. Although it's also really fun to meet in person and uh, go to lunch together and get to know each other a little bit more. So that would be probably sometime else. And you're also welcome to come to Israel. Let me know. So yeah, I will, and thanks so much for this uh, very kind and uh, flattering introduction. I'll, I'll just reiterate that, yeah, my PhD was on, with Orielan, which uh, is an amazing PI uh, at the Weizmann Institute. Um, one of the founders I, uh, of the systems biology field. And, um, and uh, there, it was, I really learned from Ori how to look at biology with systems biology, strategic thinking. And uh, there we studied um, protein dynamics as, um, as mentioned uh, in uh, response to chemotherapy. I tried to find um, uh, design principles and to uh, apply mathematical models to explain and predict the protein uh, responses and the cancer responses to the cancer cell response to chemotherapy. I always loved microbes. Uh, actually, maybe I'll mention that. I, I just already in my bachelor's, I was amazed that these unicellular microorganisms are machineries that can perform complicated functions, although they are unicellular and communicate between each other. And um, during my master's, I heard Bonnie Bastard's talk and uh, Marguerite McFalnay nice talk about um, the um, communication in the, the octopus, but not exactly octopus. Ah, no, I forgot the... The name, but this uh, Hawaiian uh, squid, <laughs> the Hawaiian squid, uh, maybe you're aware of, but those uh, that symbiotic relationship with the luminescent uh, microbes um, fascinated me even more. And, and for my postdoc, I thought to to go to the microbiome field as it's uh, like a system of so many microbes communicating between each other and um, complementing complementing the host mammalian uh, functions. So I thought it's really fascinating to study the unicellular organisms in relation to physiology. Um, so uh, when I joined Dennis, actually it was, Dennis did ask me, uh, how come you came to my lab from Maury's lab so different? And um, I asked him if he'd be interested to look at the microbiome as a system uh, and he, accepted and he wanted he wanted to pursue uh, this uh, endeavor and uh, that's how uh, we started uh, this project that became a really um, amazing collaboration also with uh, Christophe Benoit and Diane Mathis and Essen Sefik was the PhD student which is now a postdoc in Yale in Richard Flavel's lab. So it became a real strong and um, synergistic collaboration uh, where we looked at the gut microbiome or that microbiota, because we really looked at the microbes themselves. Actually, throughout my postdoc, I didn't do any metagenomic analysis. Uh, I guess it might be 
funny to say it now in the microbiome field where many studies start by, with methagenomics. Um, I shopped every Friday at the Brigham and Women's Hospital to, to get um, anaerobic um, bacteria that were derived from humans, and uh, some we also purchased to get uh, already sequenced and uh, characterized uh, microbes. And I learned a lot of immunology from Dennis Casper, from Christo Benoit, the Amatis and It was amazing. I really enjoyed it. So uh, we'll start talking about that. So um, the idea was to study the microbiome as a system, communication between them, and how they uh, complement immune functions. Maybe I'll already mention, yeah, because uh, I'll talk also about the lab. So um, I opened my lab uh, three years ago at the Technion in Haifa. We are the faculty at the Faculty of Medicine um, on the beach. So I'm, uh, you are welcome to visit. And um, we are actually continuing along these lines. So these the principles that I'll talk about here, I'll, I'll talk about also two works from the lab and uh, mentioned things that were uh, starting, continuing, uh, in progress, etc. Um, so communication between the microbes and the host. What are the mechanistic interactions, and what is the therapeutic potential of the of the microbiota? And yeah, it's already uh, well known that the microbiota was shown to be um, prominent in many types of diseases. Um, the mechanisms are starting to be elucidated, but still a lot a lot to be learned. So the questions we asked um, were, uh, what are the immunomodulatory effects of the human gut bacteria? And which gut bacteria are immunomodulatory? Um, so when we started this project, conceived it in 2010, started it in 2011, and uh, pursued it for like uh, four or five years. Um, so it's a little bit heavy. Um, when we started it, there were uh, very few gut microbes that were shown to induce immune responses in the host. Um, one of them was segmentus filamentus bacteria, as a, a mouse microbe that induced um, GH17 cells, uh, shown by Dan Littman and Ivo Ivanov uh, in your neighborhood. And uh, the other one, uh, Bacteroides fragilis, that Dennis Casper studied um, specifically in, um, in relation to anti-inflammatory um, conditions. Actually, Bifragilis was first studied in abscess models as a patho pathogenic uh, bacteria, but um, then uh, Dennis and Sarkis and the lab uh, found out that Bifragilis can also induce IL-10 and anti-inflammatory um, response in the host immune system and that it actually resides in the gut. So it's one of the most common um, gut microbes in the Western world and it um, induces uh, T-Rex and uh, IL-10 production. Um, yeah, was, is, is still studied quite uh, a lot. So we asked whether there are additional gut microbes that induce additional immune responses, or are these the major ones? Um, there were, maybe I already mentioned, there were two additional studies through the, throughout and uh, during the first um, year uh, by um, Atarashi and uh, Honda in Japan that showed that uh, Clostridium the Clostridium uh, genus actually can induce um, also T-Rex. And then uh, the thought was maybe the Clostridium, uh, maybe we can assign immunological functions to uh, genera, to, to taxonomical units of microbes. I'll talk about it uh, soon. And um, yeah, and also there was another work by uh, Gordon that came, uh, I think three years into this project that showed also individual bacteroides that induce T-Rex. So we first analyzed the Human Microbiome Project database, which then um, included about 150 healthy humans. And uh, this is the dendrogram of the different phyla that uh, we, uh, we have in our intestines. Um, so Firmicutes, Bacteroidetes, Proctobacteria, Actinobacteria, Fusobacteria, Vericumbria. And um, we chose uh, the red stars are the um, bacteria that we chose for this study. Uh, so we, we try to encompass the diversity of the human gut microbiome. Uh, we worked with germ-free mice, so very um, low uh, throughput, like uh, one at a time. At the beginning, we did uh, brainstorm whether we should do some high throughput, only one output, but many microbes. And uh, we decided to 
study each microbe very thoroughly. So then I started calling it slow omics um, and I wasn't offended. <laughs> but uh, so we, we worked with germ-free mice. Uh, we colonized them each time with one uh, microbe. All of the microbes were human uh, derived. And after two weeks, we studied their transcriptional response. Uh, the um, microbiology means uh, the colonization patterns of the, of the microbes, just whether they colonize the mouth, the gut, the stomach, um, and mainly made sure that they colonize the, the gut, the main um, area that we um, analyzed. And we focused a lot on the immune response uh, in spleens and peripheral lymph nodes as the systemic response and the mesenteric lymph nodes as the local um, gut-associated um, uh, lymph nodes, uh, the colon, small intestine, and Paris patches, which are, um, lymph, they're not lymph nodes, but uh, they're, they're lymphatic structures on the small intestine. We analyzed 23 different immune phenotypes, including both um, cellular responses and uh, cytokines. And we did this for 64 different strains uh, of bacteria. So it became like a machine. We had an, several isolators for the colony and each uh, litter uh, with uh, enough, uh, with enough uh, pups um, was moved to an experimental isolator. And we had like uh, four experimental isolators. One colonized, the other was one week uh, with, with microbes, then two weeks with microbes. Okay, taken to analysis, and then the fourth one getting ready for the next. So it was really like I became um, a machine of many hands, uh, heads, and everything. Um, like everything was very precise. It took time to build the system, to think how to do it best. And um, but once it was up and running, it was very, very structured. Same time of the day, we sack the mice. Same time of the day, we analyze the uh, same, um, same, of course, panel of antibodies in the flow cytometry. So the main method uh, of immune analysis was uh, flow cytometry um, with a panel of these 23 different uh, immune phenotypes. And um, this is the main results of the study. So this is a heat map of fold change of the immune effect, fold change over germ-free. So the left column is germ-free mice. The most right column is SPF mice. Every row here is a different immune phenotype, like monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, uh, T cells, CD4, T4 means CD4, T cells, um, FOXP3 positive, the um, uh, regulatory T cells that are also are gamma positive, we don't. And um, the first half here is colon, the second half is small intestine, and we did the same also, as mentioned, for the systemic response, their patches, um, MLNs. Um, but we were, well, we're, we're ins interested in all the organs that we studied, but the colon and the small intestine were the major uh, players uh, that we focused on. And each column here is a different uh, microbe. So, uh, and we organized them here according to their uh, phyla. So um, uh, bifidobacterium uh, from um, actinobacteria, then uh, bacteroidetes, uh, firmicutes, fusobacteria, proteobacteria, and SPF. Uh, red means upregulated compared to germ-free, and blue means downregulated. And um, the lower the graph here at the bottom is the cumulative um, response. So you can see here that first that most microbes induced a, an immune response, induced something. Very few were stealth to the immune system, which uh, I find them also very interesting. How come they colonize the gut, but the immune system is indifferent to them? Uh, I think it's also very interesting to study. Um, some are more prominent and, uh, and some less. Um, many induced uh, regulatory T cells. Um, and um, on the myeloid part, on the innate part of the immune system, there we saw more uh, of down regulation rather than up regulation of cells. And uh, yeah, and also the, the mirror image. So many microbes induced more than one phenotype, and uh, most uh, immune phenotypes were induced by more than more than one uh, microbe. It doesn't necessarily be a mirror uh, image. 
So one of the focuses was on the regulatory T-cells, um, both the specialty of the uh, Mattis Benoit lab and also Casper's lab. And, and uh, we saw that uh, many of these uh, gut microbes induce uh, these uh, T-regs. So um, this is a germ-free mice with very few uh, regulatory T-cells in the gut and SPF mice with 40%. And uh, one of the um, new findings here were that Hello. So others also now uh, see that um, also individual uh, microbes can induce the regulatory T cells up to an SPF level. Uh, let me know if uh, I got a notice that my connection is anyway. It was out for a sec, but now it's good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the next thing we did with the T-Rex was to test whether they're functional. Uh, so we induced a TNBS uh, colitis model in mice and found this inverse correlation where uh, the microbes that induced uh, Tregs at a high level uh, also um, led to a lower colitis score. So these regulatory T cells are protective against the colitis um, TNBS induced uh, inflammation in the gut. Uh, we also did another model that I won't um, elaborate on, which is a uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which uh, Z, um, Z Guan Tan from uh, uh, the CBDM lab led, uh, where we also show that um, that the microbes that induced the T17 were also functional in actually, actually exacerbating the um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, disease. So trying to look at this as a system, we correlated between the immune signatures as of the of the bacteria to try to test whether there are any um, lessons we can learn from it. So this is just an illustration. Every microbe was monoclonalized and analyzed for its um, immune effect on the host. So every every bacteria got like an immune signature. This cell was up, this cell was down, et cetera, et cetera. And the second microbe uh, reduced uh, this cell, but induced this cell. And um, we to correlate them, we like aligned them, correlated and got a number, which is the correlation var value between each pair of, of microbes. And this is shown in this uh, matrix. So each tile here is a correlation between two microbes, two immune signatures of two microbes. So this, Pink means uncorrelated. So this lactobacillus and colincella are uncorrelated. Uh, and the most interesting uh, point in this analysis was that uh, the microbes that were mostly correlated between each other came from very diverse uh, phyla. Um, so here, the ones that were highly correlated that induced a very similar immune signature uh, came from actinobacteria, protobacteria, firmicutes. So uh, we started to realize that um, one cannot assign a function or an immune signature to a phyla or a genus or um, a family. Like it's not, um, uh, it cannot be assigned by this uh, taxonomy, taxonomical level. So we also saw the opposite. Uh, two bacteroidy species could be uncorrelated or even anti-correlated in their immune effect. So it's maybe puzzling a little bit. On one hand, it's, it may, it's maybe puzzling because you can't uh, predict just by taxonomy. But on the other hand, it's uh, relieving, I think, because each of us find, um, can find our own uh, solution. So there is like, um, um, like a redundancy um, in their immune effects and uh, several solutions, many solutions can be found for a healthy um, uh, person. So um, when we started, SFB and Bacteroides were there, uh, published, uh, then Clostridium uh, mixed and some Bacteroides by the Gordon Lab. And uh, we show that many individual microbes from diverse uh, phylogeny um, origins can induce many types of immune cells. I focused on the T-regs, but we saw many types of uh, immune responses and really each one of them can be a spin-off uh, to many, many projects. 
one interesting one was the double negative T cells, which have the TCR receptor, but no CD4, no CD8, and we still didn't understand what is what are these um, cells. So just that one one uh, one uh, example of a follow up. Um, Another thing we're interested in is the mechanism. Um, what are the microbial molecules uh, that induce these cells and also how they induce these uh, immune responses? So Dennis Kasper identified and characterized very well the polysaccharide of Bacteroides fragilis and also an um, alpha-syringolipid of uh, Bacteroides fragilis that inhibits anti T cells. Um, there are still very, very few microbial derived uh, molecules that were shown to induce um, immune uh, effects in the host. Uh, one famous uh, is, uh, is the short chain fatty acids, uh, which are not structural molecules, but they are uh, me metabolism pro products of uh, microbes that induce also uh, regulatory T cells. Uh, but still this, this area is um, still uh, understudied or a lot is unknown yet. Uh, I think much of it is because it requires really an interdisciplinary, both the chemistry and the microbiology, the host physiology, the immune system, it's, it's very challenging, but also very exciting. So we have several actually collaborations with chemists now to, to look and identify uh, these molecules, the microbial derived immunomodulatory molecules. One approach we are pursuing as a fractionation of the immunomodulatory uh, microbes and analyzing which fraction is the most potent, then refractionating it and, and so on and so forth until we analyze the molecule in collaboration with the, with the chemists. One of them is the, the Clardy lab with um, Matt uh, over there, which is amazing. And uh, the other direction of uh, mechanism is um, uh, studying the way in which these microbes immune, uh, induce the immune activation. And that um, for this um, direction, we were interested to fluorescently label uh, the microbes. Also, I think it's a connection between my PhD and postdoc. In my PhD to study the protein dynamics, we created a library of um, 2000 different um, proteins inside the cells that were fused to a fluorescent marker to follow them over time in live uh, cells. Um, so in my postdoc, I realized that uh, the gut microbes are anaerobes and cannot uh, express GFP that requires oxygen to fluoresce. I'm not the only one to realize that, uh, disclosure. Um, but I really wanted to try to, um, to break this uh, challenge. And uh, uh, with Dennis, uh, we applied uh, click chemistry, which was uh, first uh, developed by Carolyn Bertozzi, in, uh, which is now in, uh, was now in uh, Stanford, um, to fluorescent label the gut uh, microbes. So GFP requires oxygen to, fl to fluoresce, but to study how, for example, this polysaccharide A of B fragilis that is well characterized interacts with the cells, um, we thought it would be uh, good to fluorescent label it. So here, um, we really focused on PSA, but, but I'll show how it's opened to other uh, bacteria and molecules as well. So for this click chemistry method, we feed the bacteria with a sugar that is attached to an azide. It's, it's called bioorthogonal click chemistry because it uh, involves molecules that are orthogonal to biology. And this is um, this azide connected to this sugar. Then the cyclooctane, the alkyne part of the cyclooctane uh, reacts with the azide to create this triazo conjugate, which is a stable covalent bond. And this cyclooctane is attached to an alexafluorophore that does not require oxygen to fluoresce. So um, we feed the bacteria with the sugar, then we um, add this cyclooctane. Thanks to these rings, there is a pressure on the um, on this alkyne and uh, it makes it very labile and they react to turn the bacteria uh, fluorescence. So this is B. fragilis eating the galnaz, which is N-acetogalactosamine, which is part of this, the PSA. The PSA um, is, uh, has a four sugar repeating unit that includes the N-acetogalactosamine. We gave B. fragilis to um, grow in the presence of galnaz, which is N-acetogalactosamine galnac with this azide. 
uh, then reacted with the cycloctin and um, turned the PSA fluorescent. And this is how it looks, the fluffy uh, fluorescent uh, polysaccharide in the outer surface of the bacteria. Uh, pink is um, the DNA. They look like donut uh, shapes because it's mostly on the outer surface. And again, the orange here is the propidium iodide. It's very uh, efficient and very specific to PSA. We tested it on other mutants, did not, um, did not affect the growth rate. So unlabeled and labeled grow the same. And also PSA that induces IL-10, an anti-inflammatory cytokine, uh, induced it also when it was fluorescent. This is from an in vitro um, assay. Um, when we inject uh, the fluorescent bacteria into peritoneum, IP, they uh, reached the lymph nodes and we can uh, visualize them here in the mediastinal lymph nodes that uh, drain the peritoneum. So white here is the bacteria's fragilis, red B cell zones, T cells, macro T cells in blue and macrophages in green. And uh, we can visualize the bacteria inside the macrophages. And um, this is thanks to a review reviewer comment that uh, said, you probably tried but didn't succeed. Just tell me you tried and didn't succeed uh, to visualize the fluorescent uh, bacteria in live uh, mice. And then we tried and succeeded. Um, actually, at the very beginning of the project, we did think about this direction, but the machine wasn't um, uh, developed uh, sufficiently for, for this yet. So here it's the same mouse, uh, just uh, anesthetized for, anesthetized for uh, 20 minutes. Um, before Govage, before oral administration of the fluorescent microbes, 2, 6, 9, 12, and 24, and we could visualize it even after 72 hours. And when we sacrifice um, the other mouse, we can really track where the bacteria go and colon how fast it takes them to colonize the colon, for example. Um, and the last uh, application of this method was uh, intravital microscopy, where this is a live mouse where we um, stitched out the ileum, the uh, terminal part of the small intestine, and uh, visualized the live uh, bacteria's fragilis in green here inside the live intestine. The blue here are uh, crypts and villi of the mouse intestine. So it's visualizing live uh, anaerobic microbes in their a natural environment. We also played a little bit with um, um, communities, but just a tiny bit, and now we're going more into that. Uh, so this allows both to, to, to visualize the dynamics of the, the microbes, to quantify them, and also to study their communication with the host uh, immune cells. And it's applicable to many microbes. So this is uh, from the paper with Dennis Casper, uh, six different um, bacteria from other um, phylogeny classes, uh, but also now in lab, we also, also label many, many microbes. So not every single, I, I wouldn't say it, it's a 100% success rate, but maybe 85% success rate, meaning um, give me your bacteria and I'll be able to label it, or you will, I'll be able to help you label it. It's not, uh, everyone can do this. Um, um, so, it, it's, it's possible to label uh, over 85% of, uh, of the bacteria. And um, when it's labeled, usually it's uh, like over 90% uh, of the population is labeled. So uh, I still have a little bit of time. So um, like eight, eight uh, ten more minutes. So that, that, the first study I, I mentioned showed that microbes, bacteria from across phyla induces all kinds of immune effects. Uh, we now analyzed and um, see that that even the strain matters. So these are different strains. I mean, here you see several species, but from each species, we analyze several strains. And you can see that the B-theta um, ATCC29741 is closer to a, bio, a biovirus and further away from another B-theta. And uh, same for B-fragilis and we recently, just yesterday, got the uh, notice that this was accepted. Um, further analyze this and um, um, and and find that, and found that really really strain matters. So when we delved into the strains and analyzed in details their immune effects on the host, uh, we find that in the colon they 
they really don't cluster together. So here again, uh, Enterococcus faecalis is further apart from another strain. And I think that the point is, uh, uh, was delivered. Um, we analyzed it both in the colon and in the systemic response and the structure is different. So it's not that they perform the same function in the, in the um, local uh, gut environment and the systemic response. The, um, um, clusters were different. So last uh, but not least, uh, we this uh, started by um, uh, work uh, during uh, my postdoc uh, just a little bit over there. I probed, uh, or I don't know, I wouldn't say a little bit, um, with uh, Laurie Comstock. Dennis was kind of uh, to enable me to work um, to start a project with uh, Laurie. Uh, Comstock there, and um, we continued it in in the lab now. Uh, so these uh, we talked about this, this uh, phylogeny and then the strain matters, but the bacteria live in a very dynamic environment. So they we we then study the system that allows them to um, to perform different functions. We believe so. It's um, I'll talk about the system, but. Uh, they have to cope with such a dynamic environment, different food, different uh, uh, neighbors, a pathogen arrives, um, inflammation or anything that the mood changes, I don't know, many different uh, effects that um, can influence the bacteria. So many bacteria, but specifically the bacteria Dalis order, um, have uh, inverted repeats in their genome that allow them th to I call it like uh, elasticity of the DNA. Um, these inverted repeats um, um, perform homologous recombination and that can change like Lori studies a lot and also Dennis, the um, on and off uh, of the polysaccharides. So it's scattered, the, these inverted repeats are scattered throughout their genomes and it allows them to switch their phenotypes very fast and, and also reversibly with uh, like these uh, switches. So one uh, well-studied uh, system is these polysaccharides, um, eight different polysaccharides in the surface of Bacteroides uh, fragilis, and uh, each one, except one, seven of these have um, on-off uh, possibilities on their promoters, and that's uh, due to these inverted repeats. Um, so. PSA is the one I talked about, which is anti-inflammatory, and uh, it was was studied in many uh, in many many papers uh, already. Um, but there are seven additional ones that Bacteroides fragilis flips on and off, and we still don't know uh, their functions. So we see this like a bet hedging of the bacteria. They um, let's say if at this at the condition now in my gut, uh, the blue ones. Um, win or they're most uh, important for me, but there are a few green ones to save the population. Then something's, some, something comes in, I don't know, a virus or um, could be a bacteriophage also maybe, um, or coronavirus. The blue ones uh, lose, but the green ones are there to save the population. The population becomes uh, green, but then uh, gradually they go back to become blue. So it's like a all for one, one for all, and um, yeah, a bet hedging type of strategy. So this system specifically is a type one restriction modification uh, system. So it's a system that can methylate the DNA and can also restrict DNA all according to their recognition uh, sequences. So um, yeah, that's my student um, trying to explain it. It's like, um, yeah, the methylation, allows protection of the DNA and, uh, and the, the same recognition sequence can be restricted depending on your phase varied condition. I'll explain a little bit more. I'll, I'll repeat it many times. It's, it's a quite a uh, complicated system. So uh, the most important uh, protein in this uh, system uh, is, in my opinion, is this uh, specificity protein, which is the one that recognizes the DNA sequences. And um, due to these flipping, there could be eight different possibilities of this uh, S protein. It looks like this on the, in the DNA. Uh, so the um, open reading frame is here, and only the blue-green will be 
um, transcribed and translated in this orientation. But there are many inverted repeats throughout, and that allows um, these uh, flipping. So it's like the blue, the blue green can can flip all around, and then the yellow, um, red will be on, and so on and so forth. Many up to eight possibilities. So. Uh, what we find uh, is that there are differential frequencies frequencies of these um, S uh, proteins. It's not that they're all uh, one to one to one ratio. In vitro, this 59 one is more uh, frequent. In vivo, actually, the 58 is more frequent. And um, to study this, um, we created uh, locked mutants. So. Um, we uh, omitted all the region of the flipping and locked the the strain. We created like uh, you know mutants uh, with only one possibility, and studied what are the recognition sequences of each of these um, specificity proteins. Um, what are the methylation patterns? I won't go into it, but we did also RNA seq and found actually that this system controls the polysaccharides. So like the beginning, I, I mentioned that in my bachelor's, I thought that the bi microbes are so smart and um, fascinating. So here again, like this type one machinery can control another phase variable machinery. Uh, I think it's really amazing. So one of these uh, orientations, which is actually on um, in several conditions uh, in vivo, can uh, upregulate um, PSB. Actually, I wouldn't say yet several conditions. It, we saw that this, uh, this orientation is more frequent in vivo than in vitro, and it upregulates PSB, which we don't know much about. And we confirmed this um, both by antibody with, uh, so we confirmed the RNA-seq um, data with uh, flow cytometry with antibody against PSB. Uh, here you can see that the, this locked on has a lot of expression of this PSB, and the wild type hardly expresses uh, PSB. And uh, here again, it's immunostaining, but also the uh, wild type and another locked on don't express that much PSB, but uh, this pink mutant locked on with this um, pink S protein expresses 60% uh, of the population expresses uh, PSB. So this is the last slide. So we talked that we cannot assign functions to taxonomy and probably even not to species because different strains of the same species could be uh, less correlated to each other than strains from other species. And now we're looking into one strain, how does this one strain can flip its functions uh, in perhaps different conditions. These, these, are, these are the things we're looking at right now. We know PSA is anti-inflammatory. What, what does PSB do? Can we tune it towards uh, one orientation in certain conditions? So. These are the things I'm fascinated about. Um, we're also continuing to develop the, the fluorescent method and uh, studying biogeography, the microbial genetic machinery. I mentioned micro microbial immunomodulatory molecules and uh, microbe host interactions in regards to physiology of the host. Uh, last but not least, we have also a couple projects on the uh, bacteriophages, which I also find very fascinating. So um, yeah, these are the important uh, students in lab that um, study these different projects. And uh, this is how they look. And uh, of course, uh, thanks to the uh, grants that support us and um, all the amazing students. I really love uh, my lab and uh, collaborators. I mentioned that the uh, uh, type 1 restriction was in close collaboration with uh, Lori Comstock and Michael Cohen. And I'm really happy to take questions. Hope it wasn't too long. Thank you, Nala. Thank you for uh, the very interesting, uh, fascinating <laughs> presentation. I, you know, it's for people who do comp completely computational work like me is so out of my mind that all the work you're able to do. So I guess I'll start with a question, but everyone feel free to ask question. And I think given we have manageable amount of people, we can unmute you if you want to ask uh, in your voice. But just to start with a question, so. Why do you think uh, like similar strains or even similar species, I guess, induce such different immune responses? I, I assume that, you know, if their taxonomy is adjacent to each other, they probably have similar antigens. Why do you yeah. think they, yeah. 
So why are they so different? Mm -hmm. It might be, yeah, actually it's something uh, that we can think uh, computationally, why, what would be the advantage to have that? Like, yes, uh, I'm really open to theoretical thoughts and um, simulations, but um, I would think it's this redundancy that, um, um, that enables many of them to, to perform uh, different functions. But we did have one study uh, with Dennis Casper, Christoph, and Diane um, to, to try to find that, to compare many genomes of the bacteria. And actually we didn't uh, find back then anything in the genome that could relate to the functions we looked at, but it doesn't mean, of course, uh, that it, this is a rule. Um, I agree, it's very intriguing. They should yeah, have I, similar antigens, I agree with you, and um, but they probably are different enough to perform different functions. <laughs> My connection yeah. was on. And that makes it really tricky that, uh, I think you showed that one species uh, induced immune response help counter colitis, or maybe I, I didn't get that part uh, that thoroughly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a study by Dennis and Sarkis Mazmanian showing that the Bifragilis and PSA reduce the colitis. That, the figure, the image of the histology you mentioned? Yeah, because I, I think, you know, we, we, we were really interested in this because we, we saw Bob Nye's paper about um, the microbes in cancer mm -hmm. that are present there and can predict cancer type. And we were thinking that maybe the immune response triggered by the micro can actually probe certain patients to immunotherapy. And we're just mm -hmm. wondering if that's a viable hypothesis. Yeah, so if I get to go correctly, that specific microbes can, also, can, um, can predict or help certain people to respond better to immunotherapy? Yeah. Yeah. In the tumor yeah, or in the blood, not necessarily in the gut. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely valid. There is also a study now out. There were were several studies, 2015 too, from Cito in France and Gajewski from Chicago, showing that uh, specific microbes can help immunotherapy or chemotherapy. And there are there were since several studies also from both of these labs and and Jennifer Vargo. And now there was another one that included Jennifer also Vargo and um, Gal Merkel from Israel that um, performed fecal transplantation from patients that responded to immunotherapy to patients that did not respond. So first, all patients received immunotherapy, not all responded, but then the fecal transplantation from the responders to the non-responders turned some of the, uh, some of the non-responders responders. And one of them yeah. even completely clean, yeah. Yeah, I remember those studies. And those are showing the microbe in the gut, right? So I'm just wondering then, you know, obviously they're in the gut, they're in the colon. Um, do you think that they also exist in sizable quantities in other places like the tumor tissues, all different tissues? And I guess with your imaging technique, are you able to see them? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I think they exist also in other locations. And in the tumors, we are um, a little bit looking at that as well. It's, it depends, I guess, which tumor we... Uh, it's more tricky because they're... Well, by uh, I mean by sequencing, it's more tricky to look at the tumors for us because the, there's a lot of uh, human DNA more than bacterial DNA in the tumors. But um, yeah, it's, it's um, Ravi Trausman's work. Uh, we... Um, help them to uh, label the bacteria outside outside the, the mouse and uh, that's how they show that the bacteria are active inside the tumor that it's not like um it's not a contamination but it's actually bacteria that are metabolically active because they can become metabolically labeled mm. if that's what you meant by labeling yeah 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 i think that's definitely related i I have so many questions, but I don't want to kind of uh, monopolize. But I think maybe it's very, uh, it's very different from what everyone here works on. So, so most here are uh, computational and cancer. 
Or... Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I think that's why we like to learn about it because we we kind of embark on this project and we realize like, oh, there are so many things that we don't know. Uh, we do mm -hmm. we do seek opinions from from J Faith Jeremiah Faith. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, know you probably know. I see you cited his paper. Yes. Yeah, but I think I think it's still like you said. The whole field has so many open questions, and it's it's so difficult to navigate, actually. Yeah, yeah. J Jeremiah is the first author on the paper that I mentioned um, about the bacteroides, individual bacteroides inducing tyroids from the Gordon. Mm, Gordon yeah, and also yeah. many other papers as well. Yeah. Okay. We have a we have a question from Tommy. Tommy, uh, do you want to just ask the question directly? Yeah, I can just ask. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, you know, besides the microbial antigens, you know, are there other um, uh, mechanisms by which the microbes could interact with the immune system? I think I've heard about metabolites as well. And, um, you know, since the taxonomic identity doesn't seem to correlate too well with the um, influence on the immune system, you know, is, I guess, is the relevant unit the, the taxonomic identity or is it sort of some sort of gene pathway which may be shared across different um, taxonomies of bacteria perhaps? Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great question. Um, uh, yeah, it's most probably, we don't know yet enough. Uh, there, the one is these uh, structural molecules like the polysaccharide, which seem to be not easy to to characterize, but uh, not impossible. And uh, so, but we don't know yet a lot of those um, in the gut. Uh, the other one is these metabolites, like the the short chain fatty acids that uh, they produce uh, when they metabolize our food. Um, and yeah, I would think that functional genes. Um, would be would be key, yeah, and, and rather than um, taxonomy. So, if we want to look at this, we should do metagenomics, for example, rather than 16S, because 16S analysis would only give us the taxonomy, um, but not their functional genes. But in metagenomics, we can delve into the functional genes and there try to look for um, correlations between. The functional genes and what they perform to the host, but yeah, it, it is challenging. But computational would be um, would be really necessary here. Thank so you. I agree. The gene pathway would be much more relevant to look at. Thanks. More questions? Yeah, we have a question from Eugenio. Uh, Eugenio, do you want to ask a question? Correctly. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for a great presentation and your work. So. Uh, my question uh, uh, fo is focused on the FOXP3 Rorgamma T phenotype that you see when you monoclonalize the animals. So my question yeah. would be uh, on the last paper of the Christophe Benoit group where he showed that it's not the microbes the ones that are inducing the T-Rex set point, but instead mm -hmm. the IgA. So I, I, was, I, I would like to hear your point of view of, about that group in, in comparison with your work. Yeah, I think it's it's um, exactly the ways to 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 look at right now. It was with with Christoph uh, Benoit that we show that the study I, I showed at the beginning was with um, um, yeah I mentioned I, I, uh, that um, where we saw that the taxonomy is not uh, related to the immune effect. So yeah, epigenetics of microbes. And um, and the IgA, there is also the study by Noah Palm um, on IgA seq and IgA coating collagenic uh, microbes. So I agree. Yeah, the the something in the environment and in the interactions with the host uh, would be necessary to understand in order to to guess or point which microbes will perform which immune functions. Did I answer your question? Yeah, sure. Th thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.